We have a uh, Ashish Laroy. Laroy, uh, yeah. Laroy, executive director for Open Hatch, and uh, suddenly, much more suddenly, suddenly much more. That's because I came. <laughs> <laughs> you should just skip this then. I can introduce you. Uh, and he's going to talk to us about quantitative community management. Great, thanks. I have this all set. Yeah, all right. Don't clap yet. Maybe, okay, for him. <laughs> so, hi. Uh, uh, so, as I mentioned before, I, uh, to the audience, the last time I practiced this, this talk, it took about an hour, and we have 45 minutes, so I'll try to be uh, concise. It might mean that for questions, if you interrupt me in the middle, I'll go off on some long tangent that'll ruin my ability to actually get to the end of the talk. So try to keep your questions till the end. But if you have some burning question, or if I'm just saying something wrong especially, then please interrupt. So uh, right, I'm Ashish. Um, briefly about this talk, we'll cover a few surveys of surveys of free software communities. The idea is to get a sense of what has been measured and how it's been measured uh, in terms of free software as a whole, and then projects in specific. And we'll shift a focus as this goes on toward more behavioral studies rather than surveys. And that'll all be quite clear by the end of this. Uh, briefly about me, I guess, I, became, I started to really know about free software in 1999, and I started to really care about it in 2000 when there was this DVD, uh, the, the ability to play DVDs on your own computer was suddenly a legal question. And I uh, read the writings of Seth David Schoen a year after that, and then I was lucky enough to be an intern at a, in a city where he lived and got to meet him in 2006. And when I moved to San Francisco in 2007 and I got to actually know him, I concluded that if I can get to know this luminary of the free software movement and his philosophy, then our community is just too small. So I have to do something about that. <laughs> and uh, two years later, I left uh, Creative Commons to start what was then a startup, now a nonprofit called OpenHatch, which is all about getting more people involved and active in free software projects. So. The first thing that I sort of wanted to get a sense of when reading surveys about free software is what is the free software community like? What are our motivations? What are our uh, demographic breakdowns? And for that, the most well-known survey and the earliest big survey on free software contributors is called the FOSS survey, uh, primarily by Rishabh Ghosh with a bunch of collaborators in Maastricht. And the big interesting thing that they found, I find, found most interesting uh, is that in terms of motivations to develop free software projects, both uh, why you would start and why you would keep doing it, the most reported motivation is to learn and develop new skills. So as someone like me who's interested in improving the size of the free software community, which in my view means increasing it, uh, maybe uh, education is a good tactic to use since that's something that people are clearly excited about in free software projects. Uh, there's this famous result from the survey that 1.1% of respondents to the survey were women. And there was a follow-up survey that uh, was just the following year that tried to get more respondents from the US because the original FOSS survey uh, was very Western Europe biased in who responded to it. And you know, they, they found this totally 50% off figure. But the error rate was enormous, 50% right. So it goes from 1.1 to 1.6%. Uh, OK, so it's not a very big difference necessarily. Uh, that's 2001 and 2002, surveys of the entire free software community. And the way that they sampled was rather than by selecting a small, well-controlled sample, they just threw caution to the wind and were like, look, if you think you're a contributor, you're a contributor. Fill out the survey. It's going to be great. Because their goal is to analyze the entire community. And like many of us know, this isn't actually a great plan. <laughs> if you're trying to get people who aren't sure if they're really part of the community, uh, they're like, They've been, uh, in Debian, there's this complex terminology about who's a maintainer and a developer and so on. And the terminology might not mesh with the invitation sent out by the people who wrote the survey and so on. Uh, this is bad news. So mostly, this just means that the, uh, the survey results will be biased in mysterious ways. Great. But we have these numbers from them. Uh, so there's a, if you want to find out more about how free software communities look as a whole, there's uh, two other piles of data that are interesting. 
One is looking at the Linux community in particular, which is a very big community. Every year, the Linux Foundation publishes a report. Recently, they published the one about 2.6.30. Uh, there's six changes per hour. There's 11 million lines. There's 1,150 developers who contributed patches, and those people came from 240 individual companies. Neat factoids. Uh, more intriguing, I think, is if you consider the median number of developers in a free software project. So some of you probably already know the answer to this. Uh, for those who don't, uh, haven't already heard, uh, anyone want to give me a guess as to what the median number of contributors to a SourceForge project is? Zero. Zero is unfair. The things exist. <laughs> <laughs> actually, that's not true. Actually, you know, the median is not defined for power offers. Yeah. Uh, so the median is one across all of SourceForge. Um, and, you know, uh, I said that these projects exist. Actually, that's, that is kind of an unfair exaggeration because many SourceForge projects contain no code. Uh, in this case, developer is defined as the number of people who have permission to push to it, basically, the SourceForge developer permission box on the left side. Uh, but if you filter down just for the mature and the production projects, the median number of contributors is still one. And that's a sample of just one-fifth as many as the whole pool. Um, now, if you're looking for projects that have been downloaded in the 90th percentile or higher, then the median, median number of contributors is now two. So even the most, even the, the top 10% most important projects that have both code and like downloads, uh, the median number of contributors is two. So open source in many ways might not be a super collaborative enterprise by looking at these numbers, which is something that looking at just a Linux report wouldn't show you. Uh, there's another uh, web-based uh, programming system called Scratch, which is all about reuse. Uh, every Scratch project is programmed with a visual programming interface, point and click, uh, and every one of them has a copy to my own Scratch box and then uh, modify it yourself. The median there is one if you give projects even a full year to mature. And on Google Code, on the 200,000 projects there, the median is still one. These graphs actually all look the same. Again, you shrink it down to the active Google Code projects, and it's the same graph. Uh, on GitHub, if we, ex if we really broaden the definition of who's a developer, and we say, if you have even clicked the, I want to watch this repo, or I want to fork this, which automatically watches it, uh, the median is still one. So, uh, but we can sort of merge these back together. Um, maybe, hypothetically, the, dif the difference from 1.1% to 1.6% that can be explained from the FLOSS polls, uh, the FLOSS versus the FLOSS US, because the FLOSS US survey went out to existing collaborative projects. Maybe the women in the free software community in 2001 were less likely to found projects. Maybe they're using separate hosting services. Uh, or maybe they're just less likely to fill out surveys. You really can't tell from the figures that we have from those surveys. <coughs> So, uh, given all this, the surveys that I've talked about are kind of just generating factoids. They're not, uh, as someone like me who's an activist who wants to improve the free software community, it doesn't tell me what action to take. It just tells me like, hooray, 240 companies this year contributed to Linux. Uh, or the median number of contributors is one, an intriguing factoid. Uh, how do we increase that? And I think a lot of this is because the people creating these surveys aren't like invested in the results. There's the old joke about, uh, about breakfast, right? Where yeah, there, when there's an egg, there's eggs and bacon on your plate. The chicken was interested, but the pig was invested. And the people here are not invested in the results. They're not the maintainers of these projects. So the other thing is Mako, who made the, the series of power law graphs that you saw, remarks that opt-in surveys are just not going to work unless you know you can categorize the errors that are being made. Um, we really can't tell in the FLOSS survey from 2001, uh, the difference 1.1% to 1.6% is that because the FLOSS US survey went out at a better time of day. Like, uh, without an understanding of at least of the whole pool of people, you can't characterize the bias you have. So, uh, going forward, well, right, right. But 1.1% uh, to 1.6%, those are pretty similar numbers. They're both, you know, it's a matter of, is the FLOSS world uh, absolutely abysmal, or is it merely totally terrible in terms of gender diversity? And, you know, 1.1% to 1.6% maybe doesn't make a big difference. But 
I think that measuring these things precisely is important because you can't necessarily know if you're improving unless you have consistent measures. And uh, you don't even necessarily know what targets to set. So if your goal is to, uh, if, you know, if, if after reading the FLOSS survey, the FLOSS US survey, you said, I'm going to do the difficult thing of doubling the representation of women in free software, all you had to do was wait a year for a different survey, and you were 50% done. So it's, uh, if you want to be a good activist, you do have to know if you're succeeding. Uh, so these surveys that I've described aren't super actionable, and they're not super, in a way, grounded in reality. Uh, so we'll try to change that for the rest of this talk. In 2008, there was a, editor and, uh, an auth a reader and editor survey that went out to Wikipedia. And you know, these are the questions they were trying to answer. Do people know the foundation is a nonprofit? Why do people start and stop editing Wikipedia? And what are the demographics of editors to Wikipedia? And this was a collaboration between the Wikimedia Foundation and UNU Merit, which actually is the same team as made the original FLOSS survey with the 1.1% women figure with the un, uh, uncharacterizable bias. Um, there was one week, there was supposedly a box at the top of Wikipedia. By the way, do any of you remember seeing this link to the survey in 2008? Cool. I definitely don't remember seeing it. Um, but I believe it was on. Uh, so, and the fact that the foundation was actually involved means that they have questions that they care about, like why people start and stop editing. The foundation wants the encyclopedia to get better. Uh, the foundation wants people to know that, that they're a nonprofit so that they give them their money. And also so they trust them more. Uh, so it's a good start. Um, but uh, the, the demographic results they got are kind of intriguing. My favorite of these is that of respondents to the survey, a quarter spoke English, okay, reasonable, and then 26%, even more than that, their primary language was Russian. Does that seem reasonable? It doesn't seem probably representative of the Wikipedia community. Um, but how can I know all I have is this survey that some people clicked on and some people didn't? 99.6% uh, of the people who saw that link didn't click on it, so it's hard to know. Uh, and the process of deciding to click on it is probably not random. Uh, we can begin to find... So the question, I think, at this point for me is, can we, can we justify uh, claims of how non-randomly distributed this survey was? And the first way we can do that is by looking at the web stats company Comscore to find out what, uh, where geographically people are based for among visitors to the Wikipedia sites as a whole. And they do that through all sorts of mostly shady methods, like toolbars embedded in people's browsers, uh, probably exploiting CSS a colon visited to see on one site if you visited another site. They're an advertising company, it's gross, but they are trying hard to be correct. And what they find is that 2.5% of the visitors uh, are Russian. So why 26%? Who knows? Um, there was a more, uh, a more reliable survey done by Pew, uh, which is a big nonprofit in the US that tries to especially understand how people interact with the media. And their methodology, as usual, is to call people, which is much more expensive. Uh, they also do a bunch of work to try to get a representative sample of the US. And when they know they don't have that representative sample, they do statistics to adjust for that. And when they publish the results, they also publish uh, a weights column, which tells you how much to discount this particular column because it needs to get smoothed out because we called five too many people who live in Tennessee or something. And uh, what, so uh, I'll go back a moment to point out that uh, in the UNU Merit Survey, even readership is heavily skewed male. It's more than two thirds male. Um, but what Pew found, oh, uh, there's one other thing to say about the Pew Survey, which is that all the percentages I'll show you on the next slide are measured in terms of percent of America, not in terms of percent of Wikipedia readers. <laughs> so the percentages won't add up to 100. Uh, it's sort of within each demographic. So for example, of men, 56% of men in America, according to Pew in 2011, uh, well, the research, the calls were done in 2010, the analysis in 2011. 56% of all Americans who are men read Wikipedia for information. 50% of women do. Uh, 
And their age breakdown looks a bit different. It looks way skewed high. Also, Pew refuses to call people under 18, so that you'll, there's an effect there. Um, but zooming in on that, there's a huge difference. Why did the UNU Merits study find more than two-thirds men for readers, yet Pew found it to be almost half and half, 47, 40, 47 53. Well, we'll never know why, but since we know that there was that discrepancy, uh, we can begin to do some data recovery and extract information out of the original sort of corrupted data set by, by adjusting the data toward the demographic information we do know. So uh, if you model the probability that people will actually click on the survey link based on the assumption that uh, the, the sort of correct figures for the gender breakdown is uh, 5347. You end up boosting female editorship counts in the main Wikipedia study from 12% to about 16%, and US from 18 to 23. Um, the foundation, when they did this survey in 2008, they set a goal of increasing US female editorship to 25%. So just by waiting for three years for Mako to publish this, well, to finish doing this analysis, uh, they've succeeded. Uh, yeah, Mako and Aaron Shaw uh, put this together. It's uh, still being peer-reviewed, but it'll be published soon, I understand. Um, so uh, the original shocking data um, led the community manager at WikiHow to wonder if they had some similar problems. And uh, Crystal Chung, if I recall her name correctly, ran a survey, and she gave a presentation about it at Wikimania. And um, I was really impressed because it was somebody uh, sort of transforming from doing sort of purely qualitative community work to doing some quantitative work. And uh, the contributor base to WikiHow is much smaller. You, the way that she did it was by, over a week period, finding all the, watching as users became active, and then leaving them an invitation to answer the survey on their user talk, <coughs> excuse me, user talk pages. So that means that she knew how many there were. Uh, the 126 people answered the survey. She left a link on about twice as many people. And it was given to them by a name that the editors in question probably knew. So, uh, so the fact that she could constrain uh, the maximum error to basically be 50% of the respondents means that hypothetically, if she found, if let's say that uh, the gender ratio came out half and half, um, that means like 60 of the respondents said they were male, 60, well 53 and 63 said they were male and female respectively. Um, there's only about 120 other people who could dilute that. So you now know for sure it's between 25 and 75 percent. Uh, and uh, if you knew that people were answering your survey fairly in a totally random way, you could constrain that even further. Uh, I'm not a statistician, but I do talk to them and I let them tell me what to do. So uh, what she found was that 56 percent of the respondents were female, which is a totally different result than on Wikipedia. Uh, but also that fifth, the median age is like 14.8. Um, <clears throat> and uh, there was a couple other really interesting things that she found. One is that the uh, older the person, the more likely they are to be male. And the other is best described in this chart. Uh, sure. In which um, new editors, about almost 30% of them are women. But as they get more and more active, uh, the gender ratio becomes more skewed male. And in fact, if you removed new editors from the pool entirely, uh, you'd see a noticeably male proportion of editors. Um, that's something that, now that she's run the survey, she can think about. Uh, until then, she had no sense of that. So uh, this is sort of an example to me of the power of switching to doing more quantitative work to check your assumptions. Uh, Yes. There are a couple ways that the WikiHow survey could have been even better. Um, so we don't know if it was a random sample of the 50% of, the of people who answered. Maybe only teenagers like to answer surveys um, on WikiHow. Or maybe, I don't know. Uh, what you could do to find this out is if you have the ComScore data for the dem demographics of who visits the website, then you can use a survey that asks about the readership as you measure it 
in the same survey as you're asking about editorship. And then just like we saw with the Wikipedia survey, you can skew your results to correspond to the, you can reverse the bias, basically. Um, the other thing is, we don't know, uh, when she said that, um, when she said that, when, when there is the age question on this form, uh, and it's like 15 or under, X, Y, and then write in, uh, <coughs> it's possible that many, many people just didn't answer the age question, and that like teenagers are the most excited about telling you their age. And I, I certainly suspect something like that is true. I couldn't quite figure out if, uh, in the survey design, if these things were true. Like, was gender, gender acclimatory? Maybe for some reason on WikiHow, men are less likely to state their gender. Uh, again, you can, you can sort of figure that, that out if you do a survey and can adjust it to other data that you already have that you know more about. Um, but, but luckily, the 50% response rate is pretty high, so it does bound the error pretty strongly. Uh, in the beginning, I talked about why people get involved in free software. And actually, one of the founding motivations I had for the way that we started running OpenHatch with uh, tools on the web for learning uh, skills you need to get involved and finding tasks to work on is based on the idea that people are contributing to projects based on wanting to learn more. But uh, in Thunderbird's case, it's somewhat different looking. So the Thunderbird community did a survey about three years ago uh, asking a bunch of questions, and the biggest factor of why you enjoy contributing to Thunderbird is you're helping millions of people or you're helping further the Mozilla mission. Uh, learning, if I recall correctly, was a stated option, but just uh, I guess it would be bucketed into other. Um, but, and you're allowed to check more than one, which is why these percentages don't add up to 100. But uh, the Thunderbird people learned something by running the survey that they couldn't have known just by reading the Gauche survey from 10 years before, which is that people in Thunderbird are different than people on average in free software. And so if you want to make your community welcoming and like, uh, grow for them, you might have to do something different than the generic solution. So uh, that's most of what I want to say about opt-in surveys. They are kind of tough to do right. I think that some of the more interesting work is done in terms of tracking people's behavior. If you can just, if you don't have to, if you don't have to let people self-select to be monitored and you just like monitor their activity because it's a public open source project, then you can get an unbiased sense by taking an actually random sample of what people are doing and what they're caring about and how they're reacting to things. So uh, in my opinion, in 2006, Gnome did the first great floss behavioral study. Uh, some of you may already know this, these figures, but in 2006, Gnome got 181 applicants to Google Summer of Code. Uh, can anyone guess what proportion of those were women? Yeah, it turns out in that case it was zero. Um, and Hannah Wallach and Chris Ball were like, F that noise, let's start a thing where we tell women to apply to Summer of Code, but we don't call it Summer of Code because the Summer of Code applications are already over. And then they got 100 applicants. Uh, and all they did was do targeted outreach. They just like rebranded the thing to put women in it. And suddenly, they went from 0% to 30-ish percent. Um, so I, I like to sort of half-jokingly say this is actually a behavioral study where they were finding out what the population of computer science undergraduates who are women, how do they react to different kinds of publicity for summer internships. Um, this was the first thing that I saw that really made me excited about the chance to really improve gender diversity in free software. Because if it's going to be this easy, then we just all need to be doing this. So there are some open questions still, I suppose. Uh, we ha the, there's more behavior we could track. We could find out if these people stick around more or less than other interns. Uh, actually, Kevin Carrillo and Marina Zarushkaya are working on some of that. Um, right now, I guess. But, uh, and actually it's worth mentioning, the GNOME, the Gnome Women's Outreach Project uh, wasn't just in 2006. It's been 
uh, going on on and off uh, for a few years and recently has been going, I think, three times a year for the past two years, something like that. Um, so it might be the single most effective mechanism for bringing women into free software. And we figured that out because Hannah and Chris did this behavioral study. Uh, and if you wanted to do a, a behavioral study of a big open source project that didn't require an opt-in survey, here's what you could do. You could select 200 for, if it's an enormous project, if you could select many smaller if you'd wanted randomly, find out their demographic info, don't ask them any questions, and just see what they do. And then you'll, uh, this will work great on Wikipedia, for example, where you can ask people to tell you how much they edit Wikipedia, or you can just read their special colon user contributions page and find out how much they edit Wikipedia. And then you would end up with higher quality results. But uh, when I was inspired by all of this, I decided to start a program called Open Source Comes to Campus where we, we Open Hatch, go visit colleges and universities and we run weekend workshops on how to get involved in free software. And uh, the first time I did this, I expected that I would have to do gender diversity oriented outreach, but what I found was that 30% of my applicants were women just because I wrote a sort of general welcoming friendly email that was the introduction to the event and I sent it to uh, gender neutral mailing lists. Uh, I mean, as gender neutral as you can get inside a computer science department in a university. But, you know, I didn't send it to the like, there actually is a club called the Dining Philosophers at Penn, uh, which is kind of the extreme computer scientist club. And I didn't send it to their list at all, I just sent it to the full computer science department. And uh, I got back applicants who were pretty diverse. Um, and so it was a great, exhausting two-day thing. A lot of people learned a lot, I thought. Uh, and we gave them a mailing list, and they chatted a little bit, and they ran one, uh, one Ubuntu release party, and then nobody said anything on the mailing list. And I'm sitting in Boston, thinking about Pennsylvania, thinking, you know, I wonder if I, wonder if I actually made any difference. Um, so uh, I took a bit to reflect, and this is what led me to learn about uh, another extremely effective diversity outreach program called RailsBridge. And what they were trying to do was address diversity in programming user groups. In particular, um, Sarah Mai uh, used this graph in a presentation she gave at the Southern California Linux Expo some years ago. Um, at the Ruby on Rails meetup in San Francisco, 2% of the attendees were women. And what that meant was like two people in the room were women. women. Um, her and another person named Sarah, as the story goes. And uh, she decided she wanted to change this, so she began, she with Sarah Allen started running how to program in Ruby on Rails workshops for women and their friends. So if you're a woman, you can come, and if you're the plus one guest of a woman, you can also show up. And uh, they look kind of like this, and the result, one year later, is that they moved it from 2% to 18%. And when I saw this graph, I realized that I hadn't been doing anything that would let me measure anything like this for what the work I was doing in Open Source Comes to Campus. Um, so from this, I realized I need, to, uh, I need to work in conjunction with an existing CS user group of some kind. And I also need to be checking in with people afterward to find out if we're if they're actually more active. Uh, later, upon talking to Mako, I concluded I should be just, uh, I should just be uh, monitoring their GitHub accounts. So um, anyway, we, we, we repeated these results in Boston. Um, I started a similar program with Jessica McKellar in f February 2011. And you know, a year, in February 2011, there was 2% because we had one woman in a room of 50 people. And February 2012, it looked at 18%. Uh, and we've actually been in Boston Python doing something kind of unusual and kind of weird, uh, which is for a while we were keeping track of not just the number of people who showed up, but a count of women also on a spreadsheet that uh, we were keeping internally among the organizers as stats. And uh, that's how we ended up being able to say that we were making a difference. So. That worked out well. Uh, since then, there have been a bunch of other Dollar City uh, Python workshops that have sprung up. T 
Tim here put one together in Auckland a few months ago. Uh, hi, yay. Um, <laughs> and there's a bunch of other cities that have been working on them. Uh, at Open Hatch, we're sort of trying to get these organizers together to learn from our respective experiences as affiliated events. Um, but there, this, this strategy doesn't seem to work everywhere, I think. Um, the strategy is bound to where there are uh, existing strong Python user groups you can glom onto, because um, part of what works about it, I think, is that the organizers of these outreach events don't have to be the ones running all the events for their gender-specific group. They can just sort of push people into the main group and then relax and not organize any events for two months while the main group does the real work. Uh, so, uh, and in New York City, uh, we're having problems uh, convincing the main user group there to run a diversity-oriented event. Um, political problems. So, um, the thing is that the 2% figure that I showed before, it's not that hard to turn it to 18%. You just have to do a bunch of work. And then your community could look totally different. So I really want to emphasize that once you know what numeric and actual changes are possible, I think it sort of is motivating and also kind of puts the onus on us to really make those changes. So like I said, I made those changes to Open Source Comes to Campus. Um, the, the two quick things I can say from the exit surveys that we started running was that about a year ago, somebody pushed me into having our gender question not be male-female, but be a text field. And I was like, oh no, people won't actually answer it now, but I guess I'll say yes, because that's the politic thing to do. And it turns out it's fine. So sorry I was on the wrong side of history. Uh, if you ask people in an exit survey to fill out a text field that is the gender question, they'll answer it 100%, uh, just like they would if it was a radio button. Yeah, and also undergrads don't know Git. That's the other thing you can tell from our exit surveys. Um, which is a shame because I tried to deliver a clone of Shorn's talk to them and like half of them were like, wow, this is great. Uh, I can see the trees move around. And the other ones were like, what is version control? So. It's better than the statistic was 10 years ago. <laughs> well, that was at uh, University of, well, yeah. Uh, yeah. If, if it's as good as 50%, it's definitely better. That's true. Uh, yeah. Um, if I have only, you said, 10 minutes like three minutes ago, um, I want to talk about a few projects and what they do to do behavioral tracking for contributors. And I guess this will be kind of a whirlwind. So the most uh, well-known first one was Migo, where they wanted to find out uh, the poor Migo project, rest its soul. Anyone in here have an N900 on them? There is a gentleman here who has one. Yeah, I think there's two or three. And, and there is another gentleman here who actually has some of the original code. <laughs> oh, right on. Uh, yeah, so they wanted to find out if the community was actually growing. Dave Neary, Don Foster put this together. Um, they made a big dashboard. Uh, they used an enterprise something, uh, enterprise business intelligence program called Pentaho, uh, which runs inside a Tomcat wrapper, which you need to write JavaScript to pull data out of everything and put it into. But Don was also summarizing it onto a nice wiki page. And you can see trends in the community. Uh, Goodness, five minutes, fine. Um, anyway, it was a lot of work, but it was very impressive. Um, the slide, these slides will be online. I do recommend that you check out the dashboard link that she has that uh, goes to her old page there. Um, thinking about what to compress. So, uh, how many of you know what Huggle is? <laughs> right. So, uh, if you're a Wikipedian and you do something wrong on Wikipedia, another Wikipedia user running this Windows program called Huggle will probably send you an automated message on your talk page and revert your change. And when they send you that automated talk, pa talk message, uh, it's just some stock thing made up by some people eight years ago. Uh, maybe they're scaring people off. So the foundation did some research by, uh, by offering alternate defaults over the course of a few weeks for what the automated messages were. And uh, the question was, if you change the text of these automated messages getting left on people's user pages, are they more likely to stick around and edit the encyclopedia? Or are they less likely to? Uh, in one case, if you stop being precise about the mistake that the user is making, then they're half as likely to fix their mistakes. But inversely, 
if you are nice and you make you use active voice and you say, I'm also an editor, you should contact me if you have questions, and you keep it short, then more users keep editing Wikipedia. They're basically less scared off by these generic messages. And these are just text strings. Easy to change. Um, I guess if I'm going to really hurry, uh, MediaWiki right now is probably doing the most work in terms of tracking contributors. They have these goals of finding out if they're shrinking and expanding, where in, where in the project is active. And MediaWiki isn't just the uh, code behind the wiki engine, it's also all the extensions and PyWikipedia bot, all the tools that integrate with it from their perspective. Um, I'll save going over these in detail, uh, but I will say that they're using some really great software by the Metrics Grimoire project, which can pull data out of Bugzilla and a bunch of other bug trackers, uh, make a mailing list statistics report, um, and the MediaWiki maintainers are also writing a monthly wiki page with summaries of those. Um, and if there's time at the end, I'll show you some of their cool code review stats. Um, the thing I want to conclude with is what I think is the coolest thing in data-driven community management, which is the Ubuntu Developer Advisory Team. They have this really boring wiki page that's like, we're some sort of generic mentorship program for new developers, and we don't update our wiki page. So clearly, it's just some abandoned thing, I thought. Uh, but actually, that's because of the, the real work is being done behind the scenes. Um, they pull in data from the Ultimate Debian database, which every night finds out uh, what packages have been changed and by whom, and they make little contact cards for each of the contributors. I'm going to show you that now in my last moment, because it is the coolest thing ever. So, uh, oh, uh, you should probably not record my screen, actually, because there might be people's names. Uh, so, if you are ever wondering uh, who is contributing to Ubuntu, and if they've been checked in on recently, all you need to do is go to Trello.com if you have the right permission bits. Uh, these cards get put here automatically by database imports from the Ultimate Debian database. Um, as soon as somebody does their first upload, it might be a good time to contact them. So uh, Daniel Holbach says he emailed this person. Um, as people become more experienced, they move automatically to the contributing column. And the goal is to get them all the way to the end here of applying. Um, and, you know, these people have the criteria met. I don't know why they're not applying, but I bet if we look at the conversations in the comments, somebody in the Ubuntu team is probably encouraging them to apply. When I mentioned this to Andrew Starbakia, uh, he I encouraged him to become a Debian developer, and he told me, no one's ever told me to become a Debian developer before. And he's one of the people who runs this project. Um, so, if, and if nothing else, that really shows the difference in how Ubuntu and Debian treat our respective contributors. Um, and if I guess I'll talk over the end of my time for about 20 seconds, I'll say the only most uh, interesting thing about all of this to me at a sort of meta level is that the Ubuntu one is really driven by Canonical. The MediaWiki stats are really driven by the Wikimedia Foundation. Uh, the Migo stats were really driven by people having time at Intel. And... Um, it's just kind of curious to me that the corporate-ish projects seem to really give, the, afford the time to actually put into high-quality uh, community management. So, uh, can I ask you a really good question? When mm. you did the text field, did anybody put in other things in female amount? You're talking about female amount, but um, no, yeah. Okay. I mean, well, they put in like M or F, but it like clearly rounded up or down to male or female. Right, that, that's really quite interesting. <laughs> yeah. So these slides are. Uh, available somewhere at a place that I forgot to write on this slide. <laughs> so I'll fix that uh, while I take any questions, if you have any. Questions? And you'll need these slides to get all these links, so I hope you all do. Do you know of any good resources for conducting sort of statistically valid surveys? I mean, just... A resource on it, did you say? Resources just for encouraging people who don't have a strong background in stats to do statistically sort of valid research in this sort of stuff, like surveys? Well, so long story short, just don't do surveys. It's too hard to get them right. It's actually just impossible. Um, do behavioral tests and then just randomly select people. But depending on what you're trying to measure, that might not work. So I'm curious if you can tell me more later. 
So we've spoke a lot about, um, you know, quantitative um, <clears throat> research, et cetera. Are you, like, do you find in the surveys that they're actually backing it up by actually asking people questions and they're actually trying to get a bit of that qualitative in there as well? Sorry, ask me that again. <laughs> Sorry, so are you finding, um, so we're looking very much here at numbers, et cetera. Do you find that any of these surveys are actually asking people how they feel or et cetera, yes. so they're actually backing that up, quantitative up I'm with qualitative? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> so uh, that means that I will now have an excuse to mention this thing at the end of my presentation I skipped over. So um, the developer advisory team in Ubuntu, uh, even though they mostly do behavioral work, they do also ask these open-ended questions of like, how is Ubuntu? Um, and they get all these interesting responses like, Launchpad is great and Launchpad sucks. At, uh, of the people who talk about it, it's 50-50. And of the rest who don't talk about it, presumably it's okay. Um, th does that answer the question? Do you, I mean, do you, are you finding that many, so you bunch do it, is, is there many others that... Well, most... I, I just, I found when I was doing a lot, and when I do the surveys and was doing a lot of that, I got a real pushback from the science, because I was actually trying to back up and use both, and I got a real kind of pushback from the science people and the math people. They're like, oh, you don't even need to ask people how they feel. Oh yeah, totally great. And it was it's quite interesting when you're sitting in that world and you're kind of trying to bridge the psychology side of it into the IT. <sighs> uh, so, I think that finding out you know, in a way, at, on one level, you may not care how people feel so long as they're doing the things you want them to do. Um, if you just want there to be more MediaWiki contributors, like if you're going to write lots of code and be grumbly but also not make anyone else unhappy, what do you care? But probably we actually do want our contributors to be happy. And I think that the Ubuntu approach really is like, how do we make you happier so that you do the stuff you want to do? But also, uh, one thing I was doing was actually using it to back up. Yeah. The, the numbers are saying this, but are the people actually feeling this? Well, right. Like, and the, the, the difficult part is getting, uh, getting a sense of how representative those answers are. Uh, yeah, sorry, a really quick comment. A related problem is that people's self-report of their happiness can be not entirely correspond to how happy they actually are. Like, yeah. you know, do, you, do you feel good about blah after doing something? Oh, hey. You may not be measuring. It doesn't mean you shouldn't measure it, um, but there's always the question of are you measuring anything real? Are you measuring happiness or are you measuring their attempt to make you happy by saying they're happy? Or there's a, yeah, there's a bunch of confounding stuff. So one way to, yeah, yeah. yeah. One, way to, one way to bridge that gap is, I didn't have time to put it into this, uh, but the Bugdilla Project did a survey of their contributors and one thing they found is that the freeze cycle basically sucked for their contributors. So they changed the freeze cycle and at this point, it was sort of just an anecdote. A lot of people seem to say it, but we don't know if it really means anything. Maybe they just like hate the freeze, but that doesn't mean they'll do any more work. But it turns out that once they fix the freeze to be shorter, they got way more contributions. So you can sort of test your theories about if the happiness questions are right by changing things. Quick last comment or question. How much do you think it helps to actually publish the result? <coughs> Excuse me. Publish the results of this because obviously there's there's a few core people probably organising the project or the event or whatever. Does it and they can change things about the event or the project. But how much does it help to publish it so that the, everyone in the project can see the things? To it depends what the it is that you're publishing. So for one example, I made a promise that it turns out I couldn't keep. But uh, the promise was that we'd respond to all emails on the Debian mentors list within four days. And uh, as we started getting close to that, m traffic actually doubled within a month or two. Um, and then when we failed to keep the promise, it went back to the original levels. <laughs> um, so I'm not sure which things you're talking publish about publishing. Yeah, well, I guess that's sort of, that's getting to it. I mean, if you were publishing the stats about how many things were coming in and how many you were acting on, yeah, that's kind of what I'm saying. Like, I guess people would... Yeah, I don't know. It's a bit of a. I think that in the, in that particular example, the fact that I chose to publish this commitment encouraged other people to try to work on that with me, so that was definitely helpful. And I think that uh, uh, the code review graph that I can show you for the Wikimedia project, uh, Garrett. <laughs> um, yes, 
no. Um, the code review stats there will basically show people that uh, volunteers patches to Wikimedia projects are not reviewed with the same latency as non as uh, employees of the Wikimedia Foundation. And I think that's mostly an encouraging thing to know as someone who could do more code review whenever these graphs load. Okay, thanks, Rodashish. I think that was very, very interesting. On behalf of Linux Australia and organizers, I want to put that you over there. Thank Great. you. Yeah.